The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode six of season two of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week, I'm sitting down with the great Josh Fries in the first of hopefully two parts. Uh, we had to cut this one a little bit short due to some technical issues, and then Josh is a busy man. He had to get to his next thing uh, promptly, so well, hopefully we'll follow up this chat with a part two soon. Um, but, you know, I start out just asking him about gear, and, you know, every time you ask someone about gear, and we're off and running. So let's get to it. The great Josh Fries. All right, so this is a show... We're right into it. This is a show that's all about drum gear, and I had the hardest time preparing because I don't think of you as a gearhead. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. I uh, I'm not as much as the average guy I think would be, but uh, but you know, I am. I, I used to kind of downplay it, you know. Well, because the thing is, I've seen. I guess it used to bother me when I was younger. I'd see guys that had all the right gear but didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, and I'd see the guy on the corner with no gear, like ruling on a street corner or in a small club with just the shittiest gear, but really playing so well that I'm like, man, or making it sound great. You know, meaning I've heard guys make nothing sound great. And I've heard guys with the best gear, best gear in the world sound like crap. So it's like, but at the same time, I, uh, you know, I appreciate good gear. I, th- I think what it is, is I've never been much of a collector. And I've never, yeah, I've never nerded out too much on it. And I've never been much of a collector. Uh, I think by the time I started getting probably the money enough to be able to collect some of my strums, I started having more and more kids and more and more college funds to save for and cars and vacations and plane tickets and extra hotel. And I'm like, okay, do I really need another snare drum? Like when I've got all these over here that sit there collecting cobwebs i just can't justify my look luckily i'm just you know like for for instance, my dad buys a ton he buys tons of old antiques tons in his house he can't even fit anything in his house not that i wouldn't call him a hoarder you wouldn't walk in his house and go oh my god this person's got mental problems you'd walk in his house and go god this is really cool it looks like a weird museum like it's interesting and it's really cool and it's not it's not a it's not unhealthy you know physically or mentally but it's definitely over the top and he's constantly wanting to go to antique stores like i'm I'm not constantly out shopping for drums, even though uh, I will say over the over the the pandemic happening and having some time on my hands, I did a couple things. I kind of like I, I kind of buffed out some of my older drums I haven't looked at in a long time. You know, I've got a lot of stuff in storage, and a lot of stuff that doesn't really get used that I'm not really looking to sell necessarily. I want to keep uh, whether it be I might use them one day or I might pass them on to my kids. Uh, but what I did do is I got I, I bought two new two new old kits. And it's the first time I've ever bought this to tell you what a the gear nerd I'm probably not. I've never bought a piece of drum gear on the internet. eBay. Wow. I never even heard of me. I never heard of reverb till last summer. You know, like what's reverb? Someone's like, oh, that's like eBay for gear. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, I start clicking on, oh, this is cool. You know, looking around. And literally, I've never bought a piece of gear on the internet. I bought a guitar like 20 years ago and I didn't know how to use eBay. So I told my friend, I go, here's some money. Give me that Les Paul. You know, he ordered it for me. Or if what I did you get? Play, well, I've always liked these drums, but probably because they're just funky and weird. And um, I've always wanted a kit. I found one that made sense. And uh, I got two like 60s tricks on kits. Of course. And, yeah. <laughs> and one, I, you know, I'm, I'm not... I'm not going for the full, like the Salvador Dali melted kick drum thing. I don't have one of those. And I don't really need one of those. I got the, I think it's called the conical kit where like, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the side of the kick that you're hitting, you know, the back head is a regular size and the front head, uh, slightly smaller. It's like 20, you're hitting a 20 and then the other end is 16. Mm. The Tom's like 13 to 12. And like uh, 16 to 14 floor or something. Got a purple sparkle kit of that. And then I got what they call like a, it's funny. It's not, I've never really heard of it before, but ginger ale sparkle. Like it's not gold sparkle. 
And uh, it's not silver sparkle. It's not yellow. It's just this weird kind of, you know, ginger ale, like yellowish greenish color. And they're regular shapes. You know, they're not weird shapes. But I think it's a, like, a, how, how about this? I don't even know. It's either a 20 or a 22, 12 and 16. <laughs> and a, mat, a matching snare to that. And then the guy that I got the purple sparkle kit from, I said, man, you don't have a snare drum, huh? He goes, no, but I sold the snare separately. Here's this guy's uh, information if you want to contact him. So I contacted the guy and said, hey, would you be into selling that snare drum? And at first he said no. And then he goes, well, I might be into doing a trade. I was like, oh, okay, well, you know. And then I kind of dropped the ball. That's on the to-do list. Like mm. was like a month ago, you know, I just, I'll, I'll get on something. And then if I lose sight of it and get busy with something else, I kind of forget all about it. But um yeah, they're, they're cool, weird drums. And really the, the first kit I traded, uh, I mean, as if we're going to just geek out on gear, I'll tell you, this is actually kind of funny. I have a silver sparkle or had a silver sparkle Ludwig 60s kit, like a 67 or 68 Ludwig, no snare drum, just rack floor kick. Uh, and I bought it a pro drum probably about 20 years ago. And honestly, the only reason I really bought it I was either at Pro Drum having this conversation or I was down the street and went by there. <laughs> I was talking with like Joey Warnaker or Abe Jr. or somebody like about gear and they go, oh yeah, I just got this and I got this vintage, blah, blah, blah. And these are often guys that don't have kids, by the way, okay? Um, <laughs> um, you no, know, but they're like, yeah, I got this, I got that, I got this, blah, blah, blah. And they rattle off with this vintage gear. I'm like, man, I don't got shit. I've got like, you know, the only vintage drums I really have are drums that have been given to me by my dad over the years. Like when I was younger, like my birthday's on Christmas, right? My parents always felt bad I was getting ripped off on Christmas. So, so once in a while I get pretty spoiled on Christmas, my Christmas slash birthday present. But I have an old Gretsch Bebop kit with 18 inch kick, 12, 14. Uh, I've got a Tangerine Sparkle Gretsch kit, a 60s Gretsch kit. Um, a red uh, cam 70s cam coat kit that I bought. So anyways, I've got these, I've got two or three or three or four cool. Uh, I've got a Radio King kit that I actually kind of refurbished over the, uh, over the, over the lockdown last year. Um, but at the time, yeah, maybe had two or three vintage kits and like 15 brand new kits or whatever, you know, recent kits. And I was like, man, I don't, I never buy any gear. I never have anything. Oh, man, I should like, why don't I go get something cool? So I, I went to pro drum or maybe I was at pro drum and just kind of like, Okay, cool. Ludwig 60s silver spark of Ludwig kit. I'll take those. And I bought them and I think I used them like twice. They just sat in storage. You know what I mean? The gigs I'm doing, lots of times I need drums that are a little more durable. Like I recorded with those Ludwigs a couple of times. They sounded great. I didn't really use them on any gigs. I well, I didn't use them on any gigs. And so, anyways, when I was gonna get this tricks on kit, the guy's like, I mean, yeah, this is how much I want, or I'd be in for a trade. Anyways, I traded him. The way shorter version of that story is I traded my Ludwig Silver Sparkle rack floor kick for this Purple Sparkle Conical Trixon rack floor kit. And uh, I just even like the little badges on the Trixon kits. They look like weird. Between that Purple Sparkle and the badge, it looks like some weird like bumper car. <laughs> bumper car colors from the 60s. And it's kind of like Jetsons, like what they thought the future was going to look like 50 years ago. You know, they're cool, man. I don't know how much I'll play them. Even a friend of mine said, yeah, they sound, uh, they, you know, they sound kind of funky. You know, there's a thing to them. And I was like, you know what? They might kind of sound crappy, but they look so damn cool. And they're so weird. They're just kind of fun to own, you know? Where and, are they? Uh, are they into your house? Uh, one kit is in storage right now. And one kit is at my house. Yeah. The, the champ, the ginger ale sparkle drones are at my house and the purple sparkle ones are in storage right now. But, uh, yeah, they're cool, man. And, you know, the, the other thing as far as gear, you know, I've like, I, for instance, I've never bought a snare drum on the internet, on eBay, Reverb, any of that stuff. And uh, the drum I'm looking for, maybe if someone sees this, they can hit me up. Mm. I'm looking for a drum. I already own one of them. And it's, especially if I find out like there's something that is almost impossible to get, then I really want to have it, you know, not all the time. But, um, and of course, my friend that made these passed away a few years back, but it's the, it's the Peisty Jeff Tree. Spirited 2002 snare drum that's made out of melted down Pisces mm -hmm. symbols. I got one probably like 2002 or three. And, uh, and I love it. I got a deep one. I used it all the time on the road with a perfect circle with nine inch nails. Um, 
I was using it recently on something I'm trying to re- I was using it. I, I, I kind of hadn't used it in a long time and I dusted it off and I was playing some shows recently with the offspring. I was using the offspring. It's just a great loud drum. And it's just got a, to me, it's cool that it's got not just metal that's melted down, but symbols that were played by other drummers. Who knows who they were, who knows where they were played, not to get all Zen and stuff, but it's like the energy that went down to whatever is into that drum and the story behind it, which we'll never know, but can only imagine, I think is really cool. I know there were some different sizes made. There's like maybe a five and a half or something. I've got a deeper one, like a six and a half or seven. But I called Kelly Peisty just thinking I could, you know, they've got four or five laying around at the shop. You know, hey, I want to, you know, I want to get my hands on another one of those Peisty snares. And she's like, oh, well, good luck. You know, we don't have any. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, we're up. No, I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm like, so when, you know, when Mrs. Peisty tells you she doesn't know where to find them, then you're in trouble. So I've been looking on Reverb, looking on eBay, nothing, you know, but I know they're out there. Yeah. You know? So... That's so, man, that takes me in so many follow-up questions. First, how sure. do you pick a kit that you're going to, I mean, could you jump from gig to gig? It seems like maybe, maybe time gets truncated from the outside, but you're jumping from gig to gig. How do you decide on what you're going to play on any given run? Most of the time it's whatever is nearest to me or already <laughs> in places. Yeah, those are ready to go. Those are, which one? I'll think of this, the gray ones, put those in the kit. I've got, you know what? I mean, the only kit that I use specifically for a band, and it's probably just because of the color, I use these yellow drums with Devo. Mm-hmm. It's just this kit I had made years ago to do Devo gigs because they were in the yellow plastic outfits and stuff. And just, I had like a bright yellow kit made. And uh, I think the only time I've played, played it is with Devo. I've used other drums of Devo over the years because I've played with them on and off for 25 years now. But when I do Devo gigs, like we just did a short run of shows and I use those yellow drums. Other than that, my sizes aren't so varied. That they're not drastic. You know, like it's not like, well, I've got a couple 26 inch kick drums and I use these 18s and 20s. They're all like 22s, maybe a couple 24s. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So really the 22 inch kick drum could be used with the Vandals, with Sting, you know, with Weezer, with Nine Inch Nails, it really doesn't matter, even though those are all pretty different bands, it's all kind of rock and roll, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and same with the Toms, like, <clears throat> and kind of always bank on the fact that I'll have a 12 inch rack and a 16 inch floor. Now where I go from there, that's the kind of my Vandal setup, it's like the Ringo setup, you know? Mm-hmm. Kick their rack floor. From there, I might do a rack and two floors. I've been using a rack and two floors on the Offspring gigs. Uh, with staying, I use two racks and two floors. Um, but once again, the sizes are all like, I could use my same sting kit that I've got with me out in Vegas right now on a Vandals gig and just take away one of the rack toms mm-hmm. and leave and take away a floor or, or leave two floors. It's not like I have to only use one floor with the Vandals. I just, that's usually what's laying around and what I usually do with them. So the, this, yeah, the setups aren't that drastically different. You know, it's just like, am I using a ride and two crashes that night? Or am I using a ride, three crashes and a few splashes? Mm-hmm. That's about as, you know, I mean, that's about as varied as it gets with a perfect, I mean, with Nine Inch Nails, I use some trigger pads, which, and with Diva, I use one trigger pad. With Nine Inch Nails, I had a couple, I had two trigger pads on my right and two trigger pads on my left. But other than that, it was a rack, two floors, a floor on my left ride two crashes and hi-hats and the ride was basically just a it was like another crash symbol mm-hmm. you know sometimes you're kind of riding but it's also there's not a lot of room for the definition of the ride symbol right um so yeah it, it's 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 all fairly similar and and i there's not a ton of thought put into what kit's going to be used because i feel like for me it's like because i've even kind of laughed with this about my friends at DW Drums, you know, I've, I've been with DW since I was a kid. I've had a DW sponsorship since 85 when I was 12 years old and started playing the drums in 88 when I was 15. And when they were, you know, their factory and offices were about the size of my hotel room right now. You know, they were just a tiny company. Um, anyways, 
more on DW later, but I laugh at them because I'm, I, I never try and make it sound like a slag when people go, oh, Josh, you're, you're really not into gear, huh? And then I go, yeah, and I play DW drums. <laughs> right. You know, well, what does that say about us? Here's my thing. I want good sounding stuff. I want it to sound great. I want it to be dependable and I want it to be uh, consistent. And if it's good, if it's great quality, great, let's move on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I know I'm always going to have great stuff. The, the, the DW gear, I don't have to worry about that. So the fact that I don't have to worry about it, that's what I want because I want to get on to playing them, making music, not sitting there and freaking out about 18 different floor toms that all kind of sound almost exactly the same. It's like, it sounds good. Great. Let's go. Let's run with it. You know what I mean? So I don't split hairs when it comes to that kind of stuff, really, you know? Um, but once again, I wouldn't be playing DW if I didn't think they were great drums and if I didn't really love them and I've loved them my entire life. So, and, and uh, knowing it's almost like I've got this security blanket with them, knowing that I, that, they're always going to be good is uh, is I can relax and just, you know, get on with things. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, makes sense. Yeah. Now, how does that translate to when you're doing session work? Well, same thing. Unless someone, unless someone is uh, really specific about, we're going to go for a real, this kind of a sound or a real, that kind of sound. Then I have to go, okay, Maybe we should bring in, you know, a, a, a big kick drum and and take some of the, uh, you know, blankets out of it or whatever the hell is it. You know what I mean? And sometimes that's just done on the spot. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Sometimes you can be in there and they go, hey, you know, let's let's take the front head off that thing and 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 not make it as dead as it is, or vice versa. You know, let's put some more pillows or whatever and then make it really dry and thuddy and dead. Uh, I guess because I've done it as long as I've done it. Also going back to the fact that I've got a bunch of really good gear that is, uh, uh, you know, consistent and, 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 and dependable. I kind of, I, if I did one session a year, I'd probably the night before or a week before I'd walk around all my gear and go, Hmm, was that I mean, doing knowing how it works most of the time in the studio? And having the, the the amount of good drums that I do have in storage and down at my house, I just go, yeah, I'll take these two snares. What's in that case? Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll take that one. And you go. It's not. And maybe the heads are old. And maybe you got to change them the next day. Maybe you don't. You know, when I first started doing sessions, I was like, well, you always have to have brand new, fresh heads. Not necessarily. You know, and sometimes the heads you have on, they're going to sound better than the new ones you put on. Or maybe it's just it's tuned just right. You don't want to screw with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. The amount of preparation that I put in is kind of surprising, would be surprising to people other than I know what's going to work and what's not going to work most of the time. And, and so I've, I've got that part of it down and being able to just use my own instinct and uh, intuition about what it's going to take. It, it usually is pretty easy to prepare. Mm. I, want to say prepare I mean, just grab the closest snare drum and run out the door. You know, in session. <laughs> so you don't have like a snare you always start with when you arrive to a session. Not really, not really. But I mean, once again, I've got uh, I've got some nice snares. It's you know what's funny. I don't. I, I really like that Pisces snare. I've got a few. I've got an old DW wood snare I like a lot, and a few newer DW like metal snares. But uh, I. You know, I've, I remember, I think it was Abe Jr. who I mentioned earlier saying to me, sat on the road once and apologies, Abe, if this wasn't you, but I want to say it was Abe that was like, oh man, yeah. you know, um, he was on a day off and he was going to a music store or a drum store. It's like, I'm still looking for that snare. You know, I'm still looking for that snare. And I'm like, huh. And I'm like, you know, I'm not. <laughs> Maybe I should. I don't know. It, it, but it's conversations like that where I go, like the like talking vintage gear, going, God, I feel like such a schlub. Like, all the, you know, I, I'm one of the top session drummers. Should I have some cool vintage gear? I better buy those Ludwig, those 60s Ludwigs quick. You know, Abe's got them. You know, Matt Chamberlain's got them. You know, Joey's got them. Why don't I have them? You know, so it's almost like, yeah, I think I'm supposed to do that, right? Um, so the thing about the snare drums is, uh, uh, you know, it's funny because I did buy a snare recently 
from Crow Drum, I want to say recently, it was just about a little bit over a year ago. And I don't know how much of a no-no this is to talk about, but I'm going to do it anyways, because it's not the, it's not the brand that I am endorsed by. Let me first say, let me go on my little DW spiel. Like I said earlier, I've been with DW since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. They make quality, incredibly consistent, great drums. Uh, I've never had a problem with any of my kits. Uh, the people there are fantastic. Watching John Good and Don Lombardi do what they do since I was in junior high school is inspiring and cool. They watched me grow, you know, as a drummer and as a as an artist. Uh, and I think that yeah, I've got a really special relationship with them. You know, I've never switched drum companies. I can't imagine ever switching drum companies, and I've got no reason to. You know, what I mean, they're fantastic drums. Um, I've never even thought about, you know, you hear murmurs of people going, I heard so-and-so switched over to such and such company because they're going to give, you know, I don't, I don't think they, they flat out just get paid money, but people will go, you know, you get promised mm-hmm. 20 clinics a year at X amount of dollars a year. You're guaranteed this. And they're going to do this many full page ads with you in drum magazines. I'm like, I really can't imagine doing that. Or what, I mean, it seems, it does seem like such a sellout to me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I've worked. I've I've worked with a, a bunch of artists. You go, oh, Josh, what a sellout! You worked with a uh, Clay Aiken or a, uh, you know, so and so. And I'm like, fuck, it's my job. People pay me to show up. And if I'm not going to go join Clay Aiken's band and leave my family for months on end, but sure, I'll do a session for the afternoon. Right. Money. And maybe if my engine, maybe a friend of mine's engineering and producing it. I don't even care what it is. And she goes, Josh, can you show up to Capitol tomorrow? Sure. What's the session for? Clay Aiken, I hate to use him as an example, but you know, or some go, you play on Kelly Clarkson records, like whatever. Yeah, but I mean, as far you as don't, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. As far as the instruments that I'm playing, you know, I, that seems a kind of a weird thing to jump from company to company and go with whoever's going to give you an ad or pay you money, you know. So anyways, my, my DW relationship is rock solid. I'm going to start by saying that. Now, okay. you know, am I kidding myself thing that no one ever uses some different drums once in a while in the studio or some different snare drum stuff, you know, mm-hmm. I think everybody does. I think if somebody says they didn't, they're probably lying. You know, uh, the majority of all my snares are DW stuff, but I did randomly buy, I did, I did what the, there's a famous Jim Keltner story of him going to do. I think he only recorded one song ever with Steely Dan. He played on Josie on the Asia album. And I think as the story goes, he was on the way to the session and he stopped by Pro Drum and said, I'm going to grab a snare drum. I don't care what brand it is, what color it is, what kind of heads is on it. I'm going to pick up snare drums and whatever one sounds great the second I hit it, I'm going to buy that. I'm going to take it to the session. So, yeah, maybe there was a better snare drum there that had a you know a crummy head on it and just was tuned bad. Didn't, he didn't care. Like maybe he could spend 30 seconds and make that specific snare drum over here sound great. He wasn't worried about it. He got, I'm going to go in whatever snare drum I can pick up off the rack and go, that's it. So he found one. I forget, and I forget what it was. It doesn't really matter. But the fact is he found it was like, this is the one. And he took it. <laughs> Supposedly he played on the track and then put it in storage and has never played it again. <laughs> the same head on it. And I mean, his gear is about... 20 feet from my gear where we keep our stuff stored and his stuff's just crazy. It looks like, you know, the last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where they're bringing the Ark into that thing and there's all this stuff. He just says, all this, but that's a lot cleaner looking. Jim's like gear is like <laughs> all over the place. Right. And uh, anyways, I think it's tucked away somewhere in there, the Josie snare drum, but I did a similar thing on, I made a record with Danny Elfman exactly a year ago, last September, it just came out a few months ago. And, uh, one day I was going to the studio and I was all excited because we've been talking about doing this record in a while and no one had really been out much still. We were only four or five months into, into mm-hmm. it. Right. But let's stop by pro drum. I said, I just want to get a simple snare drum. I don't want to go spend 1500 bucks. I don't need some collector's item. I just need whatever's going to sound really good right off the bat. I want to pick up a snare drum and go, that sounds great. So I ended up with, and I've never owned one before, but I ended up with a, a Ludwig Acrylite snare right 
And, you know, it's great because it, it, you know, sometimes people pick up snare drums and when it feels heavy, they go, oh, yeah, like it's substantial. Like this thing's got to be awesome. And this thing's got to be expensive because it's heavy. And, you know, and anyways, the Acrylite, I don't know if you picked one up before, mm-hmm. but it's just like, it feels like a toy, <laughs> you know, and it feels like you, it looks and feels like something you'd see in the back of like an elementary school band room. Yep. <laughs> just crappy generic drum, you know, nothing to it. Right. But it's, they sound great, you know? And I always say like, you know, when you open up a dictionary and see snare drum, that should be, you know, like the Ludwig acolyte should just be drum. This is what a drum looks like, you know, which is so basic and, and, but it, 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 it sounds great. And I used, I used uh, that old DW wood snare that I love, uh, on a lot of the Danny record that I used, uh, that acrylite snare on a lot of it too. And, uh, along with just a regular, uh, DW, uh, collector series kit with some, uh, I don't even know what they're called. They make these weird little, they're not roto toms, like these piccolo tom things with, they're only uh, one head, you know, they're one sided and then a really thin like metal shell and they're making like eight, 10, 12, kind of those mm-hmm. sizes, you know? really cool, really short, short, uh, uh, quick attack, you know, and just kind of like not much note or duration to it. But, uh, anyways, but, uh, yeah, as far as the snare drums go, those are the two snare drums that are used on it. And, uh, and that kit also, if we want to also geek out a tiny bit, I'll tell you a funny thing that I'm getting, that's starting to happen to me as far as I'll get into a specific thing and really like it. And, uh, one thing is, uh, 21 inch ride cymbals. I love, I don't know why, but it's almost like I can't play a 20 and I can't play a 22. It's gotta be a 21, right? Okay. And the joke is I, I have a, like my drum tech, I go, you know, like about the 21? And it, he finishes my sentence before I, before I end it because it sounds so stupid. I go, it's a little bit bigger than a 20, you know? But it's just not quite as big as a 22. It's a 21, you know? <laughs> I like, there's something odd about it. Maybe because it's an odd number, you know? I like the 21 a lot. Um, and the other thing that DW makes now, and I only have one of them, but I, I want to note to self, I want to come and get another one because I love them and it's just quirky and weird. But the kick drum I use on that Danny Elfman record belongs to a kit that I basically, I've got a little studio at my house. Mm. And when I built it, I was like, um, or I should say when I paid someone to build it for me, I, uh, when I put the drum kit in there, I said, I'm going to have a drum kit in here and I'm going to pretend like that drum kit does not exist. Like I'm not going to take it in and out of the studio. It's going to be furniture. It's going to be in there forever. And even if it's the middle of the night and, and I get a call for the most important recording session in the world, I can't take those drums. I'm just going to leave those there with the mics on them. Actually, I guess, I guess I did take them out and use them on the Danny Upman record. So scratch that. My point <laughs> is like, try, I try and leave them there. I try and not, cause I'm not a great engineer. So I've had a couple of engineer friends come in put the mics on the drums, they help me get drum sounds and then we leave them, right? And then when I have to do a session, almost like turning on the lights in your house, I can just like flip a switch, everything turns on and sounds great, right? Mm. Um, Anyways, the kick drum that lives in my studio and that I used on Danny's Danny's new record as well, it's it's a 23 inch kick drum. Mm. It's It's like 18 by 23 and they're so cool. And once again, a little bit bigger than a 22, (laughs) <laughs> it's, not quite a 24. it's a little smaller than 20 it's a 23 but it's weird to me because john good used to be weird about drums like that well meaning i never even thought that you could make a 23 inch kick drum until a couple years back but like he used to be weird about 15 inch toms he's like oh, you know it's funny he'll tell you too john good it's always like hated 15 inch toms and hated making turquoise drums for people those are like his two pet peeves no 15 inch toms no, I mean, he would do it if someone really wanted it. He'd just sit there all day and try and talk you out of it. Um, the 23s are cool. I guess what the only thing I'd say is if you're a drummer on tour, you either have to get some custom heads before you leave on the road and have a couple extra laying around, mm-hmm. or just don't take the thing on tour. Because if you're in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, you brick a kick drum head, you're not going to go down to the local music store, guitar center, and go, can I get a 23-inch kick drum head? They'll be like, oh, yeah, we can have that for you in about three weeks. We'll mm-hmm. order it. <laughs> get one you know at, down the street so you either yeah you either have to be prepared I've, I've never brought it on tour with me but uh but i definitely like the 23 inch kick you know it's an it's an interesting i i mean i shouldn't get too heavy into it because really at the end of the day you know it does it goes 
Right. (laughs) But I like it. It feels good and it sounds good. And actually on Sting's new record, there's three songs that I played on that I recorded in my garage with the 23 inch kick Mm. and a 21 inch ride symbol. And I'm sure if you hear it, you will totally be you go, yeah, that's a 21 inch ride. (laughs) Definitely not a 20 or a 22. Can it be any 21 or is it a specific 21? You know what? I've got two or three that I really like. I've got a, there's like a, I've got a 21 inch, like 20 series, mm-hmm. the 20 series, which I don't even think they make anymore. I've got a 21. I've got a couple 21 inch, like a dark energy, like, like Mach two I think they call like the Mach two and there might be, a, I'm assuming there's a Mach one. Um, the dark energy, 21 inch rides I like. And I've also got a, uh, a masters 21 inch masters that's really cool um yeah they're, they're, they're terrific you know and i've always kind of been into 14 inch hi-hats but i started using i'm using 15s right now and i've never done this live but i started messing with the studio it's so cool i used to read once in a while steve jordan would talk about it and i think abe jr who i've now mentioned i think 63 times in the <laughs> um, <laughs> i love it right um, they used to talk about, yeah, I'm using 18 inch hi hats on that track. I'm like, 18 inch hat? What are you, what are you talking about? You know, 40 inch snare drum? What do you mean? An <laughs> like, you can do that? But, I mean, that's big to me. For, that used to be, I mean, now it's a regular size to me for crashable, but I used to think that was big for crashable. Um, but man, if you, you, if you put up, I put up, I, I will say I haven't done uh, 18s, but I've got some 17 inch dark. <laughs> Spicy Dark Energy crashes that I like a lot. And mm-hmm. I've used those in the studio myself. And God, they sound so cool, man. And I thought about this, but I saw an interview not too long ago with Steve Jordan, who talked about this. I went, yeah. So what's cool about it is it really kind of blends in well with the drums. Mm-hmm. It does. It's so it's up there. It's more, it's a little darker and kind of sits a little better. It's a little more lush and a little, a little darker and just, I don't know, uh, gels well with everything else. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. When you open up, it doesn't start getting too like that. You know, it's a, it's, it's cool. And, and another note to stuff, I want to do that more often because the few times I've experimented with it, it's, it's very cool. Man. Shoo. All right. So the next question. <laughs> I don't know. But you know what? I couldn't tell you what my drums are made of. Like some of the other days, like, what are these made of? I'm like, I don't fucking know. I don't. <laughs> Maple? Oh, I don't know. That's drumstick. Well, I, I think the, the irony is that I can tell what you want to track with in one backbeat. So it's not, it doesn't really matter what you're hitting. It's something else. Your intention or the touch or there's something else there. Right. Or just knowing, God, these sound great. And you don't have to tell me where this word came from. I don't care because they sound fucking great. You know? Um, you know, Sting and Dominic Miller, his guitarist, are kind of similar. Like Sting's got a couple of these great, I couldn't tell you the exact years, but let's say it's a 57 or a 59, something like Fender Jazz bass. They're just, they're both core. It's basically the same kind of bass, right? They're gorgeous. They sound great. And they're all kind of like, they look like they're 100 years old. They're just all funky and mm-hmm. shipped up. They just sound awesome. He's got that. Then after that, he doesn't really care. You're like, yeah, just make make the bass amp sound good, whatever. Like, you know, he's not going, he doesn't have a pedal board, he's not doing any of that stuff. Um, and Fred doesn't know, he might not know what bass cab he's playing through. And Dominic, his guitarist, Dominic's got a killer tone. He plays so great. Like in the studio, we were doing something, and half the time he'll just plug direct into something. He doesn't have to have a bunch of vintage amps with a bunch of special microphones on him. Uh, we were doing a session one time for somebody and there was a guy that was kind of a gear had a guitar player that poked his head in the studio. I was like, what are you playing on this thing? And, it, and he had some like, <laughs> he's always got a bunch of great guitars, but the specific day he had this old kind of like Fernandez guitar. It's probably a $300 guitar, right? <laughs> guy goes, you playing that? But it sounds great. You would never know. It sounded awesome because it's Dom's hands and Dom's touch. And, you know, there was a decent engineer in the room and it sounded great. And, and Dom goes, yeah, yeah, you know, this guitar I used on, you know, most of all the 10 Sumner's Tales record that sold, you know, 18 million copies and won a dozen Grammys. That $300 Fernandez guitar. Mm-hmm. The guy's like, the guy didn't know whether he should be heartbroken or totally <laughs> stoked. You mean all that gear I have is like, oh, man, you know, like. 
does the, does music come easy to you? Did it come naturally to you? There's a playfulness well, to the way you work that that I feel is like very natural. I think uh, yes. Uh, look, there's two parts to that question. It does come naturally to me, mm-hmm. but is it easy? I mean, some things are easier than other things, whether it be playing them on the drums or writing music. Uh, but you know, I mean, even every night, you know, right now I'm playing a lot with Sting and we'll be up on stage, we'll be playing every breath you take, you know, which just goes do that, do that, do that, do that for three minutes. For mm-hmm. But I am totally focused and totally concentrated on every bar to make sure it sounds as as good as I can make it sound, and as perfect as I can make that sound. And uh so I'm not just up there like oh, this is easy. Like I'm, I'm trying. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not that it's not that I'm, I'm not having a difficult time trying, but I'm doing my best. I guess I was going to say at all times, but maybe not at all times. Most of the time, I'm doing my best up there. Uh, you know, and so it's like I think just because something's simple doesn't mean that it's easy. Yeah. I think that confused sometimes. You know. And sometimes some of the simplest stuff can be really difficult. Uh, so I think, yeah, music does come naturally to me and drumming does come naturally to me, but I'm faced with challenges all the time, you know, and, and just and playing and writing music. I'm always trying to do my best and, and push myself a little bit. I can probably push myself a little bit more. I gotta be honest. I do what a lot of people call like, you know, I've got a producer I work with sometimes that goes, I want you to get out of your comfort zone, you know? Don't do your favorite fails that are easy for you to do. Do something else, you know? And I think some of that maybe is fear of, of you know, well, what if I what if I mess it up? What if I fall on my face? So let, let me do the one I know is going to work. And sometimes it depends on the gig. Sometimes on the job, I don't want to experiment too much with what might work during a sting show. Mm-hmm. So I don't want him to turn around and give me the evil eye. Like, what the hell are you doing back <laughs> Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that being said, uh, he, he likes it when you stretch out a little bit here and there. But uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I got to pick my moments, you know, as far as, as far as stuff like that goes. And I think that once again, yes, it comes naturally. Is it easy? It depends on what I'm doing. But for the most part, I'm always kind of giving it my all, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did, was there something early on that you were taught, like practice a metronome all the time? What you know, what was it that got you to that point where you could play with that ease? Yeah, I think that. Uh, I mean, after messing around on a practice pad for a little bit, I I took to playing along to records right away, mm-hmm. right? And you know, most records the timing is pretty consistent, either done to a click track or they're getting the best takes they can get where the band sounds good and consistent and. Meaning the first records I played to were, oddly enough, Devo, Freedom of Choice, which is a record that I play lots of songs from every night with Devo. Uh, and that metronomically is great, really. I mean, it's Alan Myers playing drums. It's not a drum machine. It sounds like a drum machine because uh, his parts were really simple and deliberate and consistent. Um, played to Devo records. I played the early Van Halen records. Uh Queen, I had the, my first, the first records I remember owning were Queen the Game, right? Because another one, Bites the Dust, was a big hit when I was eight years old or whatever. Uh, it was a great record, just the song The Game and Dragon Attack. That's so many good songs. Uh, I played a Queen the Game, Devo Freedom of Choice, Van Halen 1 and 2. Uh, and then got in like the Cars, like I owned a couple of Cars records. This is literally like before CDs. I had the vinyl, like a couple of Cars records. I, I had a couple of police records. I had like Zin Yada Mandata. And maybe we got maybe the first or either allowed us to do more or we got it a blanc. Uh anyways, those are the first records I played to. And so after that, then you know, starting to take lessons. And then, you know, my teacher having me practice to a metronome and learn how to kind of like navigate that. And you know, when I started doing studio work, it's like luckily playing to a click track did become it came fairly naturally. And the trick I think still is to play to one without sounding like you're playing to one, you know, what does that mean when you say that? 
you know what? I don't know exactly. I, I guess trying to uh, make it sound natural and, and uh, God, it's such a funny thing to explain. Cause it's like, you know, you can't teach someone, you know, innate like time or groove, you know what I mean? Like you can teach them right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, you know, here's how a paradiddle goes. Here's how this goes. Here's how you do this fill, but then to execute it, you know, with soul and finesse and ease, that's something that that's up to that person and whatever's happening in your, in your head and your body and your just your makeup. You know what I mean? So it's, it's one of those things that I, it's hard to explain other than you definitely don't want to sound like you're, having to slow down or speed up like you're having to uh augment what you're doing to fit the click track mm -hmm. you kind of make make friends with it not fear it and somehow get into the groove of it but you know we play it to a lot of clicks live on stage with sting you know and and uh and it's great and it's easy and there's certain songs we'll be like you know what i like playing to a click on this one this one, I definitely don't want it to have a click. This one definitely needs to ebb and flow more. We should push in the chorus. Or there'll be times you'll ask me, I'll go, what do you think? Do you think we need to play to a click to this one? Do, do you like it? Do you not like it? I'll say, ah, it doesn't bother me. Like, if you want to use a click, that's fine. Sometimes he just likes having that safety net, I guess, and maybe knowing this, this, this is exactly where we set the tempos at the beginning of the tour or at rehearsal or at sound check. So even if live, if it comes down to it, if it sounds like, is this slow? I'll look at him and be like, remember, we went over this over and over at Soundcheck and we both like this. Sometimes you go on stage and you'll feel like, oh God, you want to play a little bit quicker on stage and mm -hmm. doing the gig, a little bit more adrenaline, whatever. And then sometimes we'll play and we'll both be like, screw it. I'll look at the dude running like any Pro Tools stuff off the side of the stage and be like, cut it, you know? We'll, and that's the other thing we do. There's some songs, kind of the first song in the set, Message in a Bottle, starts with the click. And after my snare flam intro, the click goes away. We just know <laughs> there's the starting point. You know, we do the same thing on the song, song next to you, and probably a few others. But uh, yeah, I mean, Sting has a tendency to push forward, you know, which I do too. Uh, I've gotten better in time laying back a bit and, you know, kind of like letting him lean over the cliff, but holding him by the back of the jeans, you know, letting him look forward and push it, but not fall. You know what I mean, yeah, yeah. Um. Anyways, uh, you know I apologize, but I, I have to go pretty soon. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, that's totally I'm enjoying cool. talking to you. You know, we can yeah. we can do it again. We should definitely do it again. I had 15 questions and I didn't get to more than three of them. So. <laughs> Okay, that's it for part one of Hopefully Two with the great Josh Fries. Uh, unfortunately, his schedule was pretty booked and he had to get, hop off the call a little bit earlier than we thought after some technical issues getting started. But uh, I got a lot out of that. Super inspiring. I'm going to go back and listen to a bunch of stuff. We didn't even talk about his new record, Just a Minute, Volume 1, 20 tracks of one-minute songs. Go check those out on iTunes. Um, it kind of epitomizes... Josh's approach to music making it's fun and witty and clever and artful and there's some pretty pretty badass drumming on there as well that's just a minute volume one by Josh Fries. anyway we'll get back with him soon for now please head over to iTunes wherever you get your podcast drop us a nice five-star review um, drop a comment and then help spread the word about the show and we will see you next week